God, thank you for taps. Thank you for the man he is and the servant of your kingdom he is, Lord. And we pray that as he brings us word this morning, as he kicks off this new series, Lord, I pray that you'd speak through him, that you'd give him the words to say, and that you'd give us the hearts to receive this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you hear me? Just want to check if it's working. Amen. If you can open your Bibles to Psalm 23. Uh, we're starting a series on the sovereignty of God. And uh, Psalm 23 is a psalm that I used to hear at funerals, and as I kind of uh, got to know the psalm more and more, I realized that the psalm was actually more about uh, our daily lives as opposed to death. Um, so I trust that God will speak to us. Um, so if you've got your Bible, Psalm 23, verse 1, um, my version says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So David wrote the psalm. David had the background of being a shepherd. So he said, the Lord is my shepherd. And I was thinking that if, if it was 2024 and God had revealed himself to uh, Generation Z or, or something like that, maybe uh, the person would have said, look, you know, you know the, the, the Lord is, is my iPad or the Lord, he might have made reference to some kind of technology. And I guess the point I'm making is that God revealed David to, to David himself in a way that David understood. Because David was a shepherd and, and, and God is so gracious, isn't he? He reveals to himself to us in ways that we understand. And if you're an engineer, you, as you're working, something of God will be revealed to you by him. So we, we are stuck with the shepherd analogy because that's what David knew. But I trust that God will speak to us through David's life. And as you go through, as you read through the Bible, you'll notice that God would reveal himself in different ways. Some people would say, well, he's my dwelling place or he's my rock or he's like a mother hen, or all sorts of analogies were used to describe who God was. And in Psalm 23 verse 1, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And the starting point is to look at the first two words that David used. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. He could have said, God is my shepherd. Or he could have said, Jehovah is my shepherd. So why did he use the word Lord, is because Lord speaks of master. Lord speaks of owner. Lord speaks of the one who's sovereign, the one who is in charge. So at, from the very beginning, David was saying, you know what, God is actually the Lord. He is in charge. And I want to encourage us this morning to always put Jesus at the center of our lives. Make sure that he is Lord. Make sure that his word governs how you live. Make sure that what he says about how we handle money governs how we live our lives. He has to be the Lord. He is sovereign. You see, there are no surprises with the Lord. So you and I may be surprised as to what happened in our lives, but the Lord is not surprised. And that's why David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He was talking about Jesus. And a thousand years later, Jesus affirms exactly what David says. So in John 10, 11, Jesus then said, actually, you know what? <laughs> David was right. I am the good shepherd. I am the Lord. 
I'm so good. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So he didn't just say, I am the Lord. He said, I am the good shepherd. God is good. Amen. Amen. If you are a relatively young Christian and you're trying to figure out the Christian life, here is the basic. God is good. The devil is bad. If you can get that, you're like at 70%, okay? God is good. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. And often as Christians, we get so caught up because somehow we ascribe to God the work of the enemy. Let's be careful not to ascribe to God the work of the enemy and remember that Jesus is the good shepherd. My question to you this morning is, do you really believe that the Lord is good? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He didn't just say, I'm the shepherd. He didn't just say, I'm your God. He said, I am the good shepherd. The analogy of the shepherd is how God revealed himself To David. You see, it's an intimate term because the shepherd knew each sheep by name. He knew the intricacies of the sheep. If there was a sheep that was limping, the shepherd would be able to tell. And you know, the thing about sheep is that they follow the shepherd. So the shepherd will be in front and the sheep are following. It's very different from African cattle, where you need to kind of be behind them, isn't it? And make sure that they're going in a certain direction. So sheep actually follow. And it's an intimate term when the Lord said, I am the good shepherd. You know, in the Bible days, the shepherd was one of the lowest paid jobs. So when God describes himself as the good shepherd, it shows us the humility of Christ. You see, the youngest in the family would be the shepherd. That's why David was the shepherd. That's why Joseph was the shepherd. So when God said, I am the good shepherd, he wasn't saying, you know, I'm actually, you know, right up there, you know. No, he was saying, I am the lowest of the low. I'm willing to lay down my life for for you. And why did Jesus call himself the shepherd? It's because he wanted you and I to be able to relate to him. He wanted you to be able to say, you know what, the Lord is my is, 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 is my combi windy. He's with me. He's on the ground. He's not high up inaccessible. He's on the ground with me. I can relate with him. He, can, he knows my struggle. He is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. You can access me. Now, here's the deal. So you'd have the shepherd, okay, with maybe 100 sheep, yeah? Sometimes the shepherd would have a servant. So this is the shepherd's servant. So what would happen is this chief shepherd would maybe have an interview, you know, like we have today, you know, interview the servant and say, you know, do you like sheep? You know, where have you done this before? And I kind of suss out if this servant would do a good job, Right? And then the chief shepherd would leave the servant with the sheep and maybe gap it for a month or even two months. But there was a deal. You would only get paid when the chief shepherd came back. Okay? So you would come back and before you get paid, he would assess how his sheep were. It's a fair deal, right? So that was the chief shepherd. So in other words, there was the chief shepherd and then there was the shepherd with a small s who sometimes would be asked to take care of the sheep. And it's interesting because in John 21, which we won't turn there, Jesus, the chief shepherd, asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I am. And he said, feed my... The chief shepherd was checking out this shepherd with a small s to see whether or not he would take care of his sheep. And it's like that we see it in 1 Peter. 
that elders are charged. The Bible says, be shepherds of God's flock. That's with a small s. That is under your, care, under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over them, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. When the chief shepherd comes, the shepherds, with the smallest, will be rewarded. Friends, here's my encouragement to you this morning. Church leaders, shepherds with a small S, should never replace the chief shepherd in your heart. However good they are, whether it's Scott, whether it's the Pope, whether it's the elders, they should never replace the good shepherd in your heart. The good shepherd, the ultimate, the chief shepherd, he's in charge and he's sovereign. And the small s shepherd is human, imperfect, and sins. And if you put your trust in the shepherd with a small s and, and they go away or, or they get sick or they make mistakes or whatever, your life will crumble. It's true. But if your affection is for the chief shepherd, when, when the small shepherd, with the, when, uh, when the shepherd with the small ears kind of makes mistakes, you can kind of navigate through life. In fact, in John 10, 11, you know, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. You see, when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away because he's human, he's imperfect. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. You see, the man runs away because he's hired. He cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus says, you know what, guys? Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. Don't ever forget. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life. Friends, I remember a time when I acted like the hired hand. In fact, there was this, it was a real life situation that happened when I was leading a church in Bulawayo. There was this couple that was going through a divorce and I remember it was quite messy and my knee-jerk reaction was to go and stand and support the brother. Okay? What I didn't realize that instead of trying to, my knee-jerk to try and support him, I should have actually tried to establish the truth. And it so happened that there was actually physical abuse in this whole thing. He was beating her up. And here I was, kind of standing with the brother without actually trying to understand what was happening. The lady felt unprotected. The sheep felt unprotected by the hired hand. She stopped coming to church. The story ends well. <laughs> but here's my point. Church leaders will let you down. Shepherds with small S's will let you down. Whether it's me, A.E., any of the elders, Scott, whoever it is, I just have one request. Just one. Please don't give up on the good shepherd. Please don't give up on the good shepherd. The hired hand will make mistakes, but don't give up on the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I like you. I won't die for you. It's the reality, okay? I'm sorry, okay? But the good shepherd will, right? The good shepherd will die. For, in fact, he died on the cross for you. Don't give up on the good shepherd. He is in charge. He is sovereign. And because he is sovereign, friends, the mission of the chief shepherd does not change. 
It doesn't change. You see, when, when, when our shepherd Scott is away, the mission doesn't change. It's not being insensitive to the shepherd with a small S. No, it's realizing that there's actually a chief shepherd whom we're ultimately following. So his mission doesn't change. And we push ahead. And we push ahead because ultimately we're following the chief shepherd. I was praying this morning and God told me that there are people here who've been hurt by shepherds. And I want to say to you, you may never hear this, but on behalf of those who've hurt you, I'm sorry. You may never get a sorry. And it's not about you getting a sorry. It's about you connecting with the chief shepherd and realizing that he is perfect and that he so loves you that he died for you. Don't give up on the chief shepherd. He will give you grace to heal. He will give you grace to forgive. He is the one in charge. He is the one sovereign. Friends, I'm halfway through and I'm only on verse 1. Psalm 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. When David said I lack nothing, I don't think he was saying he had all the money he needed and ever had in all his life. No. All he was saying when he says I lack nothing, he was making a declaration and a decision. He was basically saying, all my needs are supplied by God. I will be content. That's what she was talking about. I will be content. Friends, I find that I make the wrong financial decisions when I'm not content. I was laughing with some friends about how expensive the Smeg brand is. If you're a lady, you know what I'm talking about. I want to tell you, I want to release you. If you don't have Smeg in your kitchen, you are okay. (laughs) Do I get an Amen. You are so okay. God still loves you. You still go to heaven. You are complete. You are complete. Don't get into debt for smeg. <laughs> the most expensive things I've bought in my life, I found that I've actually never really used. I was trying to impress my neighbor, who I don't really like anyway, and they don't even notice. <laughs> I'm joking. One of the best things you could do after this service is to go to the information desk and say to them, please tell me about the Money Wise course. There is a course running. Tabanga Goto did an amazing job this last week, I'm told, on how to manage your finances, etc., etc. You can declare and decide, I lack nothing. Because he's in charge. He is sovereign. He is Lord. Verse 3, Psalm 23. From verse 2 to 3, I love this. It says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Friends, you know what? The Lord who's in charge makes us lie down. Has God ever made you do something? I've got a confession. Are you ready? I've got a confession. I wouldn't have moved from Bulawayo to Harare had it been up to me. That's my confession. God asked me to move and I was like a Jonah. Okay? I promise you, that's the one guy I want to meet in heaven. Jonah. You know, I I, I, I can feel him. Some people want to meet the Apostle Paul. You know, I just want to meet Jonah. And you say, dude, I I understand. I, I understand. Okay, so I was a Jonah. Okay? The Lord, he says, he makes you lie down. How many people have found yourselves in situations that you would have probably never chosen yourself, but it's actually good for you? And it's only when you look back, you're like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I'd rather be in your will than outside of your will. Thank you. Thank you. He makes you lie down in green pastures. And maybe you've been tempted to think that the grass is greener on the other side. 
Maybe you actually have a good husband or a good wife, but you're thinking, is she not? I wonder what it would be like if I was married to someone else. Ooh. He went there. Yeah. And maybe everyone can see that you're actually on a good wicket. Everyone can see. But you can't see it. And it feels like God is making you lie down. Friends, the good shepherd lovingly protects us from ourselves. He makes us lie down in green pastures. And when you're being made to do something, it's not always comfortable. But he's making you lie down in green pastures. Green pastures are way better than a desert situation where there's thorns and cactus. Friends, just yield and allow the good shepherd to make you lie down. He's in charge. Maybe that new job hasn't come up. Because you're actually in green pastures. I'll let that simmer. (laughs) Maybe that's where your promotion is going to come from. Verse 3 says, He guides me along the right path for His name's sake. A few weeks ago, I was talking about the Holy Spirit, how He leads us and He guides us. And it's so true, isn't it? We need the guidance from the shepherd, he guides us by his spirit. You know, God will always, always guide us in a way that gives glory to God. There's no guarantee that the guidance will be comfortable. But there's a promise that he will guide us. And maybe you don't know whether you're coming or you're going. Maybe you don't know what's happening in life, whether you should turn right or turn left. Maybe you're kind of feeling like your life is at the crossroads. Well, there's a promise that the shepherd will guide you. Hallelujah. What a shepherd. What a good shepherd. What a good shepherd. And as you begin to, 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 to learn and get a revelation of how good this shepherd is, you kind of think to yourself, you know, why should I even backslide? Why should I even run away and wander away? Because sheep sometimes, you know, just they, everyone's going in that direction, but this is one little sheep. Just starts kind of by itself. It's, it's like, so why would I backslide? Why would I... Run away from this shepherd who guides me. Verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, some versions say, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And maybe you're experiencing sickness, maybe it's financial problems or relationship challenges, and you're kind of feeling like you're walking in a dark valley, there is a promise that the shepherd will be with you. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. And when you look at that scripture, David says, even though I walk through. So you're going through. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to make it through. Don't be shy. Say, we're in church. You're going to make it through. Yeah, you're going to make it through. You're going to make it through. I'm here to tell you that you're going to make it through. Even though you're going through a dark season, you are going to make it through. Amen. Amen. You're going to make it through. You see, the fact that there is darkness doesn't mean that he's not with you. Your dark season will pass. Even death for a Christian is victorious. A guy called Charles Spurgeon. He says, the shadow of a dog cannot bite. The shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy us. Maybe you're thinking, sheesh, guys, the world is getting evil. Yes, it is. But the shepherd's presence will always be there. His presence does not eliminate evil, but eliminates the fear of evil. He fights for us. This shepherd fights for us. You know, the Bible talks about his rod and staff, okay? He he uses that to fight for us. If you remember, David was saying, you know, I've killed a lion, I've killed a bear, that kind of thing. I mean, that rod, I mean, guys could work with this thing. He fights for us, fighting off predators, fighting off predators. If you're in a relationship, you should be praying, God, God, Fight off any wolves in sheep clothing. Oh, he's gone there. Fight off any wolves in sheep clothing who are saying they love me, but
but they might be deceptive. Fight them all for God. And if you're trying to be pure, if you're trying to make the Lord the Lord in your life and you want to say no to sex before marriage and they don't understand that, then it shows that they're a wolf in sheep clothing. Yeah. Means they're a wolf in sheep's clothing if they don't understand, if they don't want to respect that. Then the shepherd is trying to protect you from this wolf in sheep's clothing. He fights for us. Bring God into the battle. All we need to do is pray. You see, he's not like the hired hand who makes mistakes and sometimes runs away. No, he is there. He wants to fight for you. And as you continue to read, verse 4, it says, you know, it says, your rod and your staff. You see, I don't know if you've seen those white garments, guys, under the tree. Have you seen some of their rods? It's like a long rod and it's got a little kahook, isn't it, at the end? Have you seen that? And it's because sometimes... You know, yes, the sheep needs to kind of be beaten into, into shape, but sometimes the neck needs to kind of be hooked to be pulled in the right direction. He protects us. He lovingly corrects us. And what happens is when you're walking in the darkness, when you're in the darkest valley, that's when you're more vulnerable to actually veering off. When you're in financial problems, that's when you're most, most likely to kind of cut corners or, or steal or, or, or cheat. Or, you know, so it's, it's in that dark place where you're most vulnerable and that's why it's in the dark place. That, that's where his rod and his staff is probably most needed because you are vulnerable. When you're in a dark place and you're, you're, you're single and that girl is not coming or that guy is not coming, it's a dark place and the temptation is massive. That's the time you need his rod and his staff to comfort you. It's in those seasons where, 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 where your marriage is on the rocks and you are struggling and you're in that dark valley. That's where you need his rod and his staff to comfort you because all of a sudden that lady who doesn't like talking to you is all of a sudden friendly to you and it's becoming a temptation and you need his rod and his staff. When you're in that dark place, thank God for his rod and his staff to guide us, to correct us because that's when we are fearful, when we're at our weakest, he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. Verse 5. The good shepherd blesses us in our darkness. He says, David says, talking about Jesus the Lord, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of of my enemies. You see, in the Bible times when you were invited to dinner, it was like it was not just an invitation to come and eat. It was an invitation for intimacy and fellowship. That's why Jesus would break bread and eat with his disciples. It wasn't just about the food, it was about the intimacy. And even in present day times when, when, you, when people are coming to eat, there's something about intimacy and fellowship. So when, when David is saying, hey, you, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, he's saying, God, when I'm in my darkness and I don't know whether I'm coming or I'm going, you invite me to intimacy. And that's, that's the word that, that, that Beck and Stu brought about God actually inviting us to intimacy, when he says, you prepare a table before me. And he does it in the presence of your enemies. Imagine God sitting at the head of the table. And there your enemies are around and he's there. He lays the table before you. Still in the presence of your enemies. And you think, well, God, you know, what? I've got so many enemies, you know, depression and sickness and, and financial challenges and, and relational challenges and fear and low self-esteem and, and a lack of hope and there's just darkness all around me. And God is saying, you know what, I'm actually going to invite you to intimacy in the presence of your enemies. 
You see, Jesus wants you in the midst of that mess and that darkness to just fix your eyes on him. That's the deal, friends. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. You can't control what's happening around you. You can't control the darkness. You can't control the fact that Russia is fighting Ukraine. You can't control all that. But you can fix your eyes on Jesus because he lays a table before your enemies. And I remember thinking, God, why are you laying a table before my enemies? Why don't you just kind of make it you and me, Jesus? Why do my enemies have to be watching? And he says, because I want them to watch me as I bless you. I want them to watch me as I bless you. That's why I lay a table before, that's why I lay the table before your enemies. Listen, friends, when you see your enemies, it's good news. It shows that it's time to eat. Psalm 23, verse 5. I'm about to come to close. He says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Friends, sheep were anointed with oil for a number of reasons. The shepherd would anoint the sheep with oil on their heads for a number of reasons. Firstly, what would happen is the male sheep would be butting heads. Butting heads. The male sheep will be butting heads and he anointed their heads with oil so that there will be lubrication so that when they butted heads, there was minimum damage to the sheep. And you see, God kind of oils our relationship. Have you ever been in situations where you've kind of butted heads with someone and it, you kind of think, I don't know how we managed to reconcile that. I don't know how we actually managed to, 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 to be restored as a husband and wife. I don't know how we kind of ma I managed to reconcile with my mother-in-law. I don't know how I managed to reconcile with my brother, my sister, my friend, my boss, my, my employee. Well, you see, God he anoints our heads with oil for the restoration of relationships. He anoints my head with oil. The second reason why the shepherd would anoint the sheep's head with oil was to heal from scabs. So there would be all sorts of kind of things happening on that head. And that oil would be a healing balm. And the oil is, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And there's a promise right there that Jesus is our healer. And that's why we continue to pray for Scott. That's why we continue to pray for one another. And we're pressing in. Why? Because he anoints our heads with oil. The shepherd would anoint the sheep's head with oil. And for today, finally, he would anoint their heads with oil. Because the oil would act as a repellent from parasites and snakes. You see... Friends, God protects us and he repels the enemy when we stick our no noses in the wrong places. I don't know about you, but you, I've, 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 I've so many situations in my life where I've stuck my wrong in the wrong, nose in the wrong place. I know it was my fault. And then God miraculously just saves me. I mean, last week, I needed to get my car remended, repaired or something wrong. So I thought, you know what, I should, take it to, should I take it to my usual mechanic? But as it goes, I've got a cousin, you know. So I'm like, hey, my cousin. Took it to my cousin, bless his heart. He didn't fix it properly. In fact, it, what actually happened is that I was driving a long distance uh, journey. And then the wheel, the front wheel just kind of, poof, something broke. And it wouldn't move. Thank God it happened, not on the highway, but when I was going at 20 k's an hour in one of the towns. And I remember thinking, thank you, Lord, for anointing my head with oil. I stuck my nose in the wrong place. I should have just done the right thing, okay? I should have just gone to the mechanic, get it fixed properly. And here, if this thing had happened on the highway, I don't know what would have happened. He anoints our head. He's a good shepherd. He is such a good shepherd. Such a good shepherd. He anoints our heads with, I don't know what situation has happened in your life. When you look back, you just know, had it not been for the Lord, who'd been on my side. 
Had it not been for the Lord who'd been on my side, had it not been for the good shepherd who'd been on my side, I would have perished. He is a good shepherd. Finally, verse 6. David was clear, very clear. He said, surely your goodness and your love shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He was clear. He was expecting goodness from the good shepherd. Where's your heart this morning? Are you expecting goodness from this good shepherd? Are you expecting goodness from this good shepherd? There is no room to backslide once you have a revelation of how good he is. How good this shepherd is who is in charge, who is sovereign, who is Lord over all. You won't want to backslide. You won't want to, to live your life in any other way. You won't want to cut corners. You, 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 won't, you, you want to serve him. You want to love him. He is the good shepherd. And what's really amazing concerning this shepherd is that the Bible says that the shepherd, the good shepherd, will leave the 99 and he'll go after the one. He'll go after the one that's wandering. He'll go after the one that's lost. And I want to pray for us this morning. Perhaps you can stand. Let's stand together. I believe that there might be people here this morning well, if you're to be honest, you are that one. While well, Jesus, the good shepherd, is speaking to you, you have an opportunity to come to the good shepherd as the band comes up to the front. You have an opportunity to come to the good shepherd. And the Bible says that he stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. So if you're here this morning and you're saying, actually, you know what, I need to come to the shepherd. I need to come to this good shepherd. I want to give you this opportunity. If you're here and you're saying, look, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want to make him the Lord of my life. There's an open invitation.